proceeding, uh, today's proceeding to a uh, briefing with the Canadian group of the Interparliamentary Union, and we will follow this with some subcommittee uh, work that will be in camera. So to ensure an orderly meeting, encourage everybody to have their microphones on uh, mute. Uh, when your uh, time comes up for, for questions, uh, at uh, just about with 30 seconds left, I'll just kind of flash this card. So you'll see that you've got 30 seconds left of uh, timing for questions. And for those that, uh, that require interpretation, you'll see the globe at the, uh, at the bottom of your screen and you can click on that for English or French. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our witness, somebody that is no stranger to uh, all of us. I don't know, I'll refer to him as the, uh, the Honorable David McGinty, also our MP or Mr. President of the uh, Canadian Group of Interparliamentary Union. Well, welcome, uh, David, and uh, for, for joining us here and uh, being able to give us your uh, your brief and uh, and then take questions and then we'll wait for uh, for your colleague uh, David Cunningham Carter to uh, to join us when uh, when he when he can. Okay, so you'll have uh, five minutes at this time and uh, you'll be leading off. So, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, good evening, colleagues. Uh, it's good to see so many of you again. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in the Interparliamentary Union or the IPU and specifically its Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians. Uh, the Parliament of Canada has a long history with the IPU, having formerly joined the organization in 1912 and reconstituting the modern day Canadian group of the IPU in 1960. Today, the Canadian group has 68 members of parliament and 25 senators as members. I'm here today hopefully soon with my colleague, the Right Honourable David Carter, until very recently a member of the New Zealand Parliament, a former speaker, and a former very active member of the IPU's Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians. L'Union Interparlementaire qui a... The Interparliamentary Union, which celebrated its 130th anniversary in 2019, is a world group with national parliaments from around the world. It is the oldest such organization. Right now, there are 179 national parliaments that are members, and it works in collaboration with the United Nations to promote democracy, peace, and cooperation between peoples. The Interparliamentary Union is interested in many, in many topics, for example, tensions in the Middle East, healthcare, sustainable development, violent extremism, international humanitarian missions, and young parliamentarians. On the human rights of parliamentarians is the only international mechanism that seeks to protect and defend legislators experiencing human rights violations such as torture, kidnapping, murder, arbitrary arrest, and detention. This committee, comprised of 10 parliamentarians from around the world, carries out in-country missions and meets in camera several times a year to examine ongoing cases and new complaints. Its most recent report and decisions, released in November 2020, address cases involving 160 members of national parliaments from 13 countries, including Venezuela, Belarus, Uganda, the Philippines, and Egypt. These are only a portion of those the committee examined in 2020 and confirm an overall upward trend in violations of parliamentarians' human rights. 85% of which are cases involving members of the opposition. The list of alleged human rights violations documented in the 2020 report, and Mr. Chair, includes murder, torture, and other acts of violence, intimidation, arbitrary arrest and detention, abduction, lack of due process and fair trial proceedings, 
and violations of freedom of opinion and expression. Generally speaking, the committee's decisions do four things. First, provide a detailed description of the complaint. Then express concern for the alleged violation of human rights, followed by an affirmation of the IPU's readiness to support capacity building within various public institutions. And finally, encourage parliamentary, governmental, and judicial authorities to take the appropriate measures to ensure that the human rights of parliamentarians are in fact protected. I encourage members here this evening, many of whom are actually members of the IPU, but may not know that much about the Committee for the Protection of the Human Rights of Parliamentarians, I encourage them to ask my esteemed colleague, Mr. Carter, for more detailed information about the committee's procedures. To conclude, Mr. Chair, the information contained in these reports really serves no purpose if awareness of them remains limited to those who participate in the IPU. Their value, I feel, and I think our executive committee of the IPU in Canada feels, is magnified when they are broadly promoted and more clearly integrated into the work of national parliaments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and colleagues, for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGinty. Uh, I'm just going to check quickly with the, for, you, for your remarks. I just want to check quickly with the clerk. No, we don't have connection yet. No. Okay. So we are going to open it up to uh, to questions, uh, Mr. McGinty. The first round is uh, seven minutes each uh, questioner will have, and we are going to uh, start it off with uh, Ikra Khalid from uh, from the Liberals for seven minutes. Ikra. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. McGinty, for coming before our committee on this uh, really insightful um, project and initiative. I, 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 as you said, I had no idea that this existed. So, can I can I ask you um, how did this kind of originate? And uh, I and I, I realized, you know, what you you had sent us a kind of a draft uh, decision and a report. Uh, on parliament, uh, parliamentarians that have suffered abuse and decisions from the the UIPU on this, um, how do you come to that decision? What is what is the mechanism towards coming to that, uh, and how do you ensure that there is a balance uh, from from world views and a good representation from all uh, of your member states from the IPU uh, in, when when it comes to these decisions? Well, thank you very much, Ms. Khaled, for the question. Mr. Chair, the, the Committee of Ten is selected from different geopolitical groups that comprise the IPU as a whole. And they are nominated by those geopolitical groups. They work in camera, so much of the information that they obtained is considered to be confidential. They meet uh, usually, uh, sometimes for full weekends. I know of instances where the committee met and worked, frankly, overnight to deal with the kinds of evidence and information that is put to the committee. They have a team of evidentiary experts in Geneva at the IPU head office, so they warrant the information as best they can. They sometimes conduct field visits to uh, countries that are affected, where the parliamentarians, uh, may, where parliamentarians may be at risk. Uh, and they, uh, you can see through the information that would have been distributed to you, there's a sort of a generic, um, um, there's a generic uh, approach to this, a summary of the case, um, the facts as presented, uh, the decision that's been rendered by the committee. These folks on the committee, the 10 of them are chosen for their human rights expertise. So in the past, we've had Canadians um, for example, Robert Douglas George Stanbury, uh, an MP, Senator Joan Nyman. The committee was established in 1975, and since then we've had people like Senator Sharon Carstairs and the Honorable Irwin Kotler serve as its president. So um, there are a number of distinguished human rights experts who have served over the years and continue to serve on the committee. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. McGinty. Uh, in terms of uh, the repercussions of, uh, of a parliamentarian being reprimanded uh, through this platform, um, 
on on human rights violations uh, a, towards their own parliamentarians in their own uh, in their own governments, etc. What is the impact of that? I mean, I, I noticed that you know uh, this organization refers a lot of matters to the Secretary General um, and and makes uh, some some very marked remarks as to you know what the implications of the human rights abuses are. Lists out uh, the the evidence that is uh, that has been noted. Um, but ultimately, have we seen uh, what the impact of this is uh, within the UIPU? Uh, in my time working with the IPU for um, maybe five years now, um, what I've noticed, perhaps the most powerful thing, Ms. Khaled, in terms of issuing the reports, um, uh, here's a practical example. A former member from Venezuela of the committee um, is no longer a member because of um, reports that were issued by this human rights uh, parliamentarians committee. Um, the power of exposure, the power of the pulpit, the power of distribution of the findings and comments made by the committee in the media, which is then often um, broadcast uh, in the affected country, um, is very persuasive. Um, so it, it it's delicately exercised by these 10 human rights experts who pour over the evidence and they're very cautious. There is an ongoing debate. I would be less than fully transparent if I didn't say there's an ongoing debate among some members of the IPU about how far the committee can go in um, interfering in some people's minds or examining the conduct of a government in a, in a sovereign state. Um, but the committee seems to have found a way to deal with that in the formatting of its reports and the, I think the robustness of the evidence it relies on. Uh, thank you. And and just as a follow up on, on evidence, um, is there a, a formal data collection mechanism uh, in terms of uh, how many people have been, uh, have been complained against uh, what the, what the genders of those people are, what the, the victims and, and, uh, and, and their, uh, you know, their, their genders and their identities are, is there some kind of compilation of evidence through the IPU uh, on, on those that are victimized a lot more? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and I think, it, I think what you're asking is how does this all sort of start? And the question really is who can submit a complaint to the committee? And um, we know that's the parliamentarian or the former parliament, parliamentarian herself whose fundamental rights have been violated or a member of their family or their legal representative, could be another parliamentarian, could be a political party, a national or international human rights organization, the UN, for example. Um, all complaints are submitted in writing with evidentiary backup uh, to the president of the committee or to the IPU secretary general. So yeah, there's a robust collation of evidence. And if it's not sufficient, the committee might send executives or analysts back to explore and try to get more information to buttress the case or to make a decision whether to go or no go in pursuing the complaint. Thank you very much, Mr. Briganti, for all of Thank your hard work and, and for your representation on the IPU. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to uh, Mr. Kenny Chu from the Conservatives for seven minutes. Mr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Mr. McGinney, for coming and talking to us. I, I have a, um, a, the first question I have, it's regarding the UIPU selection of these uh, studies. I, I had a glance of the report, and I noticed that uh, uh, of the uh, 13 cases that you've documented in that report, um, six of them are from Africa, two of them from Americas, Two are from Asia, one Europe, and one Middle East. I understand, of course, that um, the different continents or different areas of, of the world has implemented uh, various levels of democracies and your focus in how parliamentarians have been, have been treated or their rights violated. But uh, can, you, um, can you just give us a, a highlight of how are these cases being uh, being uh, studied and how do, how what is the selection criteria? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, in deference to our our, our colleague uh, who's just I think joined us from New Zealand, I think, and I'm not avoiding Mr. Chu's question at all. It's just that Mr. 
the Honorable uh, Speaker Carter is so much better prepared than I am and experienced to deal with that uh, question. I'm in your hands, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if you'd like me to proceed or whether you'd like to move sideways, so to speak. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Chu. It's Mr. Uh, Chu's Mr. line. Chu, yes, yeah. um, Mr. Chair, I, I actually uh, submit to your decision. Uh, I'm okay one way or the other. I noticed that our guest is actually in the in the Zoom call. So if you decide to actually let him speak first, I'm totally okay. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was thinking just to ask all the members if we would let, uh, allow Mr. Carter, Speaker Carter to uh, to give us, yeah, okay, great. Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Carter. We're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, technology's working around the globe. And uh, so uh, we know you are a former parliamentarian and a former speaker of New Zealand House of uh, Representatives. And uh, we've uh, heard uh, uh, Mr. McGinty speak highly of you. So we'd like to hear what, uh, what you have to say and then take questions from members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, members. I apologize for uh, taking some time to connect. Uh, we did a test call a couple of hours ago that went without difficulty. We spent the last 40 or 50 minutes, but we're finally there. I was going to make a few opening comments um, about my involvement with this committee, and then I welcome questions. I'll try and cover Mr. Chu's question towards the end of my presentation. But very, very briefly, what staggered me as a New Zealand parliamentarian was the extent of abuse that actually occurs as in many democracies around the world. Uh, we take it for granted down here, and I suspect in Canada, you are relatively uh, uninformed, unless you have a special interest in the human rights of some of the abuses that occurs uh, to elected representatives right around the world. I recall being in Geneva and talking to our embassy there on an IPU visit before I was involved in this committee, and the uh, collectively our staff there said of all the work that the IPU does, the most valuable work is this committee. And subsequent to that, my first involvement was as a former speaker to be asked to join a mission to the Maldives. And we travelled there, we spent a couple of days there and spoke to opposition MPs. Some of them were imprisoned, incarcerated in awful conditions. Uh, there were MPs that were not being advised when Parliament was sitting because they're opposition MP. Others were arrested when they entered the Parliament building, et cetera, et cetera. We uh, concluded our report. We uh, published the report to IPU and they disseminated it fairly widely. I know that it received a lot of local uh, uh, publicity in the Maldives. Subsequent election meant that that regime was thrown out. And the last time I was involved, uh, the uh, democracy there was operating significantly better. Um, I guess my then membership of the committee occurred straight after that. It is a committee of 10 members. They are elected at the um, plenary sessions. Uh, you've, all you've got to show is an interest in human rights and human right abuses of members of parliament. And if the plenary elects you, you're on the committee. It's a five year term. To move to Mr. Chu's point, how do we hear about the abuses that are occurring? We receive complaints and one of the processes we address straight away in these meetings we have is whether it meets the, um, the, the criteria for us to continue further investigation. Uh, so we're dealing with countries like Venezuela, like Turkey, like Cambodia being some of the obvious ones. Uh, I re my last involvement with this committee before I retired as a member of parliament was a trip to Turkey where there are clearly significant abuses occurring to people that have been democratically elected. So they pass a criteria as to whether they're eligible for us to further investigate. We then uh, will meet uh, aggrieved parliamentarians if they're traveling to these plenary sessions. On the odd occasion, we put together a mission if we're able to go to these countries, make the necessary inquiries. One of the real, um, Spotlights of our reports then is our presentation to the plenaries, which used to prior to COVID occur every two years. They're a session towards the end of the plenary, the day four or day five, but most delegates who have traveled to those plenaries take a huge amount of interest in the work that the committees do, are doing and therefore become far more well-informed of some of the abuses that occur. I think that's a very quick wrap because I realize I'm late in getting to the call, but I'm only too happy to take any questions.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carter, and we'll do a handoff back to uh, to Mr. Chu, and you, you've got a, still at least a good six minutes, Mr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate uh, you not taking the advantage and persecute the opposition here, but uh, joking aside, um, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, happy to uh, to not be in that report. Canada has uh, has a fulsome and uh, comprehensive uh, democracy that we enjoy. But let me get back to the, the question that I have. Uh, the, the, the reason why I, I asked that question is to either of the two witnesses is um, in 2019, 2020, one of the things that we have seen is a, a, a blossoming democracy in Asia that has been actually taken to uh, in, the, in the reverse direction, many of the um, people elected um, politicians, legislators have been arbitrarily disqualified. And, uh, and as a result, they, they were disqualified for life. And, and of course, I'm talking about Hong Kong here. And I wonder why the committee did not pick that up and uh, had uh, conducted some study on that. Mr. Chair, do you want me to answer that? Uh, please, yes. Of course, the, the situation in Hong Kong has uh, occurred more recently since I was no longer uh, a member of the committee. It may well have received complaints from Hong Kong opposition members of parliament, and it may well be undertaking some investigation. To make progress, you've actually got in, in a situation like uh, Hong Kong, and I suspect it won't be long before we're hearing from opposition, uh, from members of parliament in Myanmar, for example, to make progress you've actually got to get into the country and talk to the people who have been abused. You've got to talk to some of the authorities. Uh, if you can't get in, it's difficult to do anything more than a superficial investigation. And the best example I can give you, and it's in your continent, Venezuela. They keep saying they'll invite this committee there. It has never happened, but we're all well aware of the abuses that are occurring to opposition members of parliament in Venezuela. Uh, thank you. Thank you um, for your input. Um, speaking of Venezuela, we understand that the opposition parliamentarians have been facing threats, suppressions, and surveillance. Um, um, needless to say, intimidations and violence. Is, is there any uh, suggestion in the report or in the committee that uh, parliamentarians around the world, including here in Canada, that we could uh, do, especially as SCRR, the International Human Rights Subcommittee here, uh, that we could actually focus on and perhaps uh, shine some lights into that or take some action to help our fellow parliamentarian. In the case of Venezuela, we actually have a member of the committee who's from Venezuela. She gives us um, heart rendering stories of how she effectively has to escape from the country fear of whether she'll be arrested as she leaves Venezuela to go to the very plenary sessions we used to hold pre-COVID, uh, and then the difficulty of her getting back into her country. We have, uh, despite not being able to visit Venezuela, have done regular reports. I'm trying to think of the number of MPs involved, but I think it would be about 100, in excess of 100 members of parliament are on the list of the, uh, the investigation into that specific country. We do make a substantial report to the plenary session. So David uh, McGinty, correct me, there'd be six or seven or 800 people who would be at the plenary sessions. They are hearing of the abuses of the, that are occurring, not that it's not public knowledge, uh, but um, the, the session that we give to the major plenary session certainly reveals the difficulty that we're, we're having in getting proper information and furthermore, it uh, shows the difficulty that those opposition MPs are having in a, well, it's no longer a democracy, it's a dictatorship, isn't it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wonder how, many, how much time I have left? Yeah, 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Okay, in the uh, remaining 90 seconds, I wanna put a focus on uh, Zimbabwe. We actually, this committee has also heard the situation in Zimbabwe uh, with female politicians being adopted, uh, adopted, and uh, you know there there are cases of forced disappearance happening. Um, I wonder if you could also um, 
help us to uh, to determine what uh, an advanced democracy like Canada can do in uh, um, a spreading like a, a blossoming uh, democracy, um, you know, like like in Zimbabwe, perhaps a little bit more specific suggestion. Uh, it's not, I, I don't think I'm in a position to advise the Canadian politicians what they can do in Zimbabwe. Can I give you a very close example? Um, Fiji. Fiji, a very close country to New Zealand geographically, a country that wasn't a democracy, became a democracy. When I became speaker, I actually went and spent two or three days with parliamentarians, particularly with their then speaker, with members of parliament, with opposition members of parliament, trying to do what we could as a a larger country close by doing everything we could to help a struggling democracy. Um, I think the developments in Fiji would mean they are developing a democracy that's true and relevant. Uh, countries have got to decide how they're going to help these um, countries with weaker democracies, but you make very little progress unless the weaker democracy is prepared to cooperate and realize that it needs assistance. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Carter. We're going to be moving now to MP Brunel Duceppe from the Bloc Party. Uh, uh, Mr. Carter, I don't know, do not know if you are bilingual in English and French, but at the bottom of your screen, there is a globe that uh, will allow you to switch on so that you will receive interpretation. Mr. Brunel Duceppe. Bon. Merci, merci. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair, and thank you to our uh, guests tonight. It's very interesting what we're learning tonight. I do have a few um, questions. I'm wondering whether you can have um, dissidents within the uh, IPU group. I'm thinking of an example. When uh, in Catalonia, the parliamentarian were in detained by the Spanish justice, perhaps there were uh, frictions in among parliamentarian. I don't know how you react in those kinds of cases. When, when we have these plenary sessions and there's visiting members of parliament and there's conflict between two countries, we often have some very heated discussions. And I can think of the situation and the relationship or lack of relationship between Palestine and Israel. Uh, if you go back to Venezuela, they try to send non-elected people who the president has declared to be elected uh, instead of genuine uh, elected members of parliament. Uh, so this conf conflict will occur on the floor and the plenary of these sessions uh, can't be avoided, but it, I think it is a demonstration then to the balance of members attending IPU plenaries of the problems and the uh, angst and uh, arguments that are occurring between countries and even within countries. Thank you for your answer. So was there some kind of complaint when the uh, parliamentarians in Catalonia were uh, put to prison? recall any uh, cases lodged before the committee whilst I was a member in respect of Catalonia. No. But I haven't been involved now for the last 12 or 18 months, so something may have developed since. Okay. So you confirmed there was no, no complaint. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, something else, and I don't know if it's part of your discussion, if it's a concern, but we see that even in the West, uh, there are a situation, of course, it doesn't compare to other countries, certain other countries that are a developing country or what happens in uh, Myanmar right now. But that's something that we saw more and more. It was um, kind of very slow, but now we see that there's a lot of conspiracy theories and you see um, a civil um, arrest of uh, uh, MPs. We saw that even here um, um, last year when they did, uh, uh, citizens were come out, um, arresting MPs. 
Well, is this something that is uh, very not very important, or is it something that is taking uh, more and more importance? If I may, situation you're okay. referring to an arrest of MPs within Canada. Um, if an an MP breaches our law and is under suspicion for our law, then perhaps that person should be arrested. But what we're talking about is genuinely elected representatives and these other democracies that are then that denied their right to partake in democracy. And uh, it, the point I made at my opening remarks, Canada and New Zealand live in very benign democracies. They work. We have elections. Sometimes we don't like the result, but we all accept the result and we move on and wait for the next election. That does not happen in many democracies around the world. It was an eye-opener to me, the extent to which it's occurring. And I think at the moment, the committee I'm referring to is investigating about five or 600 MPs that have been abused and their human rights have been denied in a total of 42 countries. It's a widespread problem. Uh, Mr. McGuinty, I think you had uh, you wanted to add an answer. Yes, I would like to add something. Maybe uh, the most important things, or one of the most important things of the about the IUPU, is that it's a, a way to regroup in a way. We are uh, one thousand or one thousand four hundred um, uh, parliamentarian. La, most of them are speakers of uh, houses, so our group is a significant group on the international level. And when we are a uh, Canadian parliamentarian, we are often meeting people in bilateral uh, meeting that is to say we can really express our concerns about what happens in uh, Zimbabwe or Myanmar or else and uh, anything that has to do with capacity building Canada already supports uh, the I IPU and it was a two million uh, and a half, two and a half million dollars to help uh, with uh, women in politics so we really are engaged with technical assistance in many countries, and including Zimbabwe. And on uh, page 18 of the report, there is the case of uh, Joanna Mamombe, a woman of Zimbabwe. And uh, the uh, significance of the IPU in the world is that, that we can bring together different players of uh, the countries that uh, we are trying to bring back to uh, the UP, for instance, um, we are trying to get the US back in the IPU. Uh, they are not here since uh, 1940, um, 94, but uh, we are trying to get them back. Um, so you're telling, you, uh, telling us it's a, a place of um, where we can exchange ideas. Thank you very much. We're going to move now to our next questioner. That'll be uh, NDP, Ms. Heather McPherson for seven minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much to both of the gentlemen for your testimony tonight. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the areas that I've done a bit of work in and I'm, I'm quite interested in is, is in terms of you know, electoral observation, ensuring that the actual process to getting parliamentarians into the position is, is fair and equitable and I'm just wondering, is that something that is part of the mandate of, of, of your group? Is that something that you look at, at the, the fairness in which parliamentarians, I guess, become parliamentarians around the world? A uh, short, short answer to that is no. We accept the regime that operates, uh, the democratic regime that's been determined by every country. So the cases we are dealing with are people who have been justifiably and legally elected under their own jurisdictions, but then subsequently denied the ability to do their work. If so, I might add to that, if I could, Ms. McPherson, of course, of course, that's a debate that the, uh, I, I have the privilege of sitting on the executive committee of the organization uh, worldwide. I represent 47 parliaments. 
uh, on that executive committee, including New Zealand. And um, it's a debate that's ongoing. Is it, a, is it of comparative advantage for the IPU to pronounce on the, the, free, the freeness and the fairness of elections, so to speak? And the decision has been taken at the executive committee level to hold back on that front because there are other groups that appear to be very expert uh, in this kind of thing. So it relies more on the United Nations and other groups that track elections and election observation missions. Okay. And so, um, for example, let's look at Belarus, where there is not, there was not a fair, uh, transparent, free election, and that that the the winner is not recognized. You would not recognize that parliament, therefore, you would not examine the res- You know, if there was a, a anything brought up about that parliament, it's not recognized by your group. Then, when I was involved on the committee, there were, from memory, two or three cases from Belarus. So, um, short answer is. Uh, Provided they've been duly elected and can prove to us that they are duly elected members of parliament and then they suffer abuse, then that's eligible for us to do further work on. Okay, thank you. Um, And moving on, I actually, one of the things that I find in this subcommittee that we really struggle with is that there are a number of human rights um, abuses that are happening around the world. It's very, very troublesome and, and very difficult to determine how to triage or prioritize the the the, the varying um, issues that we want to study. I'm just wondering for, for this group, for the IPU, how do you determine the priority? How do you triage what I can only imagine is, is, is quite a numerous uh, um, amount of reports that you have to look into? Yeah, no, I don't think that's the difficult one. Some abuses are so blatant and so horrific, they go to the top of the pile almost immediately. So mm-hmm. again, it, it depends on the circumstances, but uh, Tanzania was one we dealt with towards the end of my time on the committee, a horrific situation where a, a leader of the opposition was assassinated, uh, I think from him was shot 32 times and still managed to survive, escape the country, then looking for assistance to go back into the country at their recent elections, where I do note he was unsuccessful. But the triaging becomes fairly obvious. Mr. McGinty, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, sometimes the the egregious nature of the specific cases that are brought to the committee actually end up being brought back into a plenary session with 1,500 legislators or 1,200 and form uh, usually, sometimes often can form a subject of an emergency debate. And uh, all legislators will be brought up to speed on the nature of this uh, wrongdoing or challenge. And it's a very, very high exposure uh, setting with lots of global media, newscasts, online feeds, et cetera, Twitter feeds. And of course, um, uh, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 frontline legislators. So Oftentimes, if it's egregious enough, it just simply migrates into the assembly and dealt with there. Okay. Okay. Well, and and that's one piece that I was I was sort of thinking of that com- that that connection between the the International Human Rights Subcommittee and the work that you're doing, and and one of the things that I'm wondering about is, you know, would is there the possibility for for there to be for the IPU to feed in or or to recommend studies for the committee? Is there ways for us to benefit from the research that you've done or to the lessons that you're learning or recommendations that are coming from you? Has there been a relationship between this subcommittee and this committee and the IPU in the in the past? And is that a potential? Oh, there's a very strong relationship between the committee and the other delegates, many of them who are regular attendees to IPU plenaries. So the way it was working again prior to COVID is the opportunity for us to get together over four or five days twice a year and share concerns was a way by which the members of the committee, because there's only 10, but it's the way by which members of the committee then were involved with discussions with the other 14, 1500 attendees. So many of them were able to give us good information, perhaps on a neighbouring country that we were investigating. The benefit of us getting together at these fora to discuss these issues is immense. If, if I could add to that, I think the possibility for cooperation between this subcommittee and the work of the IP on human rights is, is, uh, for sure, is, is certain. Um, 
this is one of the first times I can recall, and I think the, 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 the House of Commons staff tell me it could be one of the first times in over a decade where we've come to present the findings of this particular committee. We're really trying to have a rapprochement between the work of the IPU through its constituent parts. So uh, absolutely, Ms. McPherson, if the, the best way to proceed is to try to get engaged, become a member um, and, and, and meet regularly. And perhaps with the chair's help, there might be, there may be issues that just simply deserve to be tabled mm -hmm. in a domestic setting. That's what we're trying to do. Take the international resolutions and debate and discussions and operationalize them at a domestic level. And if I could just very quickly add, uh, congratulations to Mr. McGinty to organizing this particular meeting, because one of the problems is, for instance, New Zealand, we take three members of parliament to such a committee uh, meeting. I'm the only New Zealander that's ever sat on this committee. We come back into the parliament of 120. How do we actually tell them of the work we've been doing and the abuse that's it? Occurring. So there is a definite relationship between any specific subcommittee or committee in any parliament focused on human rights, then working far more closely with the Human Rights of Parliamentarians Committee. Well, I hope we get to work with you very much in the future. Thank you very much, both okay. of you, gentlemen. Yes, thank you. And that, uh, so members, we're moving into the uh, second round now. So in this round, it'll be five minutes of uh, time for questions. And uh, we'll start with Anita Vandenbelt, Liberal member. Anita. Thank you very much. Um, and again, I would like to echo the thanks to both of our witnesses for uh, for, for your testimony this evening. Uh, I think we're all learning a lot about uh, about the work that IPU does, which I think a lot of us uh, felt we were familiar with, but weren't uh, necessarily aware of this particular aspect of it. Um, my specific question follows up on something that Mr. McGinty said, um, which I think is very powerful, where he mentioned the power of exposure. And uh, we know that there are other groups of legislators globally um, that are that are working on this in this avenue for instance um, parliamentarians for global action uh, I'm involved with something called part which is the parliamentary rapid response team um, it sounds like it operates similarly with a small group of parliamentarians uh, but it works very very quickly so within 24 hours of something happening there will be a tweet there will be a statement issued um, and then some statements in national parliaments um, and then there's also so I know that Erwin Kotler is also involved with the Raul Wallenberg, where they have the Mandela Project, where they link MPs uh, from certain countries with human rights defenders, where they become paired, where they would raise issues in their own parliament. How would you see the work that IPU is doing um, able to inform some of those, those other activities? And to what extent are you already cooperating with other groups of legislators that are trying to do the same thing, where it's about exposure and raising awareness? I think that's more a question for Mr. McGinty to answer uh, being on the executive, but uh, I actually think the IPU can do more to respond more rapidly to situations than it does because it's a multi uh, international uh, forum. They probably need time to get their ducks in a row, so to speak. But many, many times, if IPU was a bit quicker on the response, for instance, Myanmar over the last three or four days, I think that would give better profile to the work of IPU. But I'll let David get us out of this hole. <laughs> I, that's a really, really good uh, question, Ms. Vandenbelt. The IPU is just launching into a new five-year phase. And uh, I, I'd like to take that suggestion about rapprochement and more coordination and quick response capacity back to the executive committee. I think we're meeting, um, we're meeting this week, tomorrow or Friday, or, and again next week. And it's thinking through what a five-year, this next five-year plan should look like, what it should be doing to become relevant and, and helpful. So I know that there is cooperation that goes on with some of these different initiatives, but the IPU, if there's anything I think Mr. Carter can speak to as well better than I, having sat on the committee, it's making sure, making really sure that when reports are issued, they're robust, that they're evidence-based, and that they're waterproof. So that when you come out of the gate and you say something as a group as big as the IPU is with 179 parliaments, um, it's irrefutable. So I think that's what the real focus has been on. 
and and uh, I I do think that the work that you're describing is vitally important. I've often felt that uh, if we look at who the front line of democracy is, it is legislators. It's elected members of various parliaments. We know that authoritarian uh, forces are working globally. And if we as legislators, as the front line, aren't working globally, um, then then we won't be able to, to proceed. So I, I think this is very important. Um, my second question, if I have time, Mr. Chair, uh, is about gender, because uh, I've done a lot of work uh, before politics um, internationally on women in politics. And we know that women face, especially women who are legislators, um, face different kinds of attacks. They face sexual violence, attacks on their families. Um, do you find in your reports, uh, I noted that you divide it by gender, but do you find that the nature of the threats and the nature of the human rights abuses that female parliamentarians are facing is different from men? And how are you tracking that? In the cases I can quickly recall, the short answer to that question is no, the abuses that were occurring to duly elected members of parliament were across the board. There was no difference in the abuse occurring, be it, uh, be it uh, male or female. Um, I think the issue you raise is actually a bigger issue and it's been one that's been a focus in the last couple of years from a country like New Zealand, where the women parliamentarians here have actually acknowledged they face pressures that their male colleagues don't. And that's now that it's been brought to light and it uh, may be the same in the Canadian House. Now that that's been brought to light, it must be addressed. Thank you. And that'll now we'll move over to the Conservatives and uh, Mr. Scott Reed for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm trying to get my head around which kinds of uh, countries are the ones that are most likely uh, to be responsive to pressure and abuse having occurred in the country as your starting point. Um, which countries are likely to be responsive? I noticed, uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham, that the two countries you had cited as having had success were the Maldives and Fiji, both of which are quite small countries. So as a starting point, is it the case that you find that smaller jurisdictions are more likely to be responsive to pressures in very large countries to be less so? I think the, the criteria for a satisfactory response is a genuine will that they will respond and want to respond. So the two cases I give you, but particularly Fiji. Fiji came out of a long period of military control. I think they genuinely wanted democracy. Uh, I think they've made good and substantial process, progress towards that democracy. There are other countries, Venezuela, it wouldn't matter what report was written and presented to the plenary. There's no will to change in that country. So I don't think size is important. It's willingness to actually, it's the desire to have a functioning, true, constructive democracy. And if that's not there, because there's a dictatorship at the top, our reports probably won't receive much uh, positive feedback. What about the distinction between, um, I mean, fundamentally there are, if we leave the Swiss aside, there are fundamentally two kinds of democracy, I think, uh, Westminster-style parliamentary democracies with responsible governments and countries on the congressional model of which the Americans are the most prominent, but Venezuela would be in this category too, where there's a distinction in the executive functions separately from whether or not it has the, uh, the confidence of the uh, uh, legislative branch. Does that make a difference as to... Uh, uh, well, first of all, as to how responsive they are, and secondly, as to the appropriate kinds of tactics to use in order to uh, achieve response. Uh, I'm, of course, familiar with the Westminster system, and I think there the response is probably more immediate. In a country like the American system, a response does occur, but it probably takes longer to occur and only occurs at an election. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the kinds of uh, acts that occur and uh, to which you try to respond, um, there are, and I don't think, we're not talking about the worst offender countries, countries which are, as in the case of Venezuela, I mean, I know you tried to work in Venezuela, but with limited success, it's slid so far out of, of democracy. It, it suggests to me that even those who are engaged in uh, inappropriate acts 
or at least some elements of the governing party have a desire to make the country more democratic than it is. Uh, I suppose what I'm asking is, uh, is it the case that you require a certain degree of goodwill or guilty conscience on the part of the perpetrators or some part of that organization, that party, whatever, that is conducting the abuses? Well, I'm going to use an example, Mongolia, where we've done quite a lot of work in a mission to Mongolia. The original so-called father of democracy was assassinated. And I think I'm right in saying late 80s or early 90s, Mr. Zorik. No one was ever held accountable. And the suspicion was that those people then proceeded to the highest levels of both their government and their civil service. More recently, they actually did charge three people with that murder and convicted them and jailed them. And only after, and again from memory, because no longer I've read the report recently, 10 years later, did it uh, become apparent that those people never committed the murder, they'd been uh, jacked up crimes and uh, imprisoned. Uh, so that was a case that's ongoing. We've never got to the bottom of it, but um, that was done because Mr. Zorag and his surviving family deserved justice. And it was a case where it was abuse of an elected representative. It needed tidying up. I'm sorry, I'm just actually confused. I'll just use the few seconds I got. Let's just ask for clarification. You're saying in the case of Mongolia that after the assassination occurred, at, at, at some remove of time, there was then a charge made against individuals who ought not to have been charged. These were trumped up charges that's, against them? That, that's exactly how it turned out. It's like reading a novel. Look at the last report. It'll be online, I'm sure, from IPU. Uh, these people were jailed. They spent considerable time in jail. And then it became evident there was a, a video that was released that showed these people being tortured to plead guilty. Uh -huh. They were never guilty of the crime. Um, and we've never found, we've never got accountability for the murder of Mr. Zorg. Thank you. Thank you. And moving now to uh, the block and Mr. Brunel Duceppe for uh, five minutes. Thank you. I would like to thank both witnesses tonight. It's the last time I talk to you tonight, so thank you. Something that's very important for me is young parliamentarians. It's the next generation. Choices that we make today will have an effect for them. So more and more, we have to lead, the, to lead them to participate. At the IPU, it's not only important, it's something critical. So I'd like to know, is there a proposal for a for young parliamentarians at, in the union if i may yes absolutely three years ago the ipu chapter in canada invited i think we received 130 young parliamentarians in ottawa for four days every two years there's a meeting of young parliamentarians well, that was before COVID, obviously. And secondly, there is a committee that has as a goal the participation of young people. And recently, after our discussions in the executive committee, I proposed that the new president, uh, who, is a who is Portuguese, So that there would be in the new five-year plan something about inviting about 15, 20 young parliamentarians so that they could tell him what their vision is for IPU. Donc, de plus en plus, on, on mise et on vise les jeunes pour aller chercher leur, leur bon conseil. Est-ce que, est que vous avez une bonne participation? Est-ce qu'il y, y a beaucoup de membres de l'Union qui sont jeunes? Oui. Oui, typiquement, les délégations ont euh, des quotas euh, et okay. de, dans les femmes et, et aussi des jeunes. D'accord. Euh, 
je reviens parce que tantôt, euh, vous avez piqué ma curiosité. Euh, vous avez parlé euh, de la nouvelle administration Biden euh, aux États-Unis et que c'est peut-être notre fenêtre. You were referring to the new Biden administration. The sound had cut out, the interpreter regrets. Is all good? Is everything good? Yes. Don't do that to me, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm just kidding. So there are quotas for men and women, quotas for younger people, etc. Now there's something that piqued my curiosity. You were referring to the Biden administration. It's potentially, it's possible that the Biden administration might lead to re-involvement of, Amer of America. Is there a strategy to that effect? And can you share that with us? Answer, yes, absolutely. The Americans, the U.S. left the IPU between 1990 and 93, I believe. The executive committee decided two weeks ago, actually, to send a letter to uh, the speakers of both houses in Congress, uh, in other words, Senator Lee and Senator Pelosi, correct? Madam Pelosi, I suggested that the letter not only be sent by the new chair, uh, the, the Portuguese chair, but that the 18 members of the executive also sign on. And that also includes representatives from China and other countries to invite Americans or the U.S. to rejoin the Committee of Parliamentarians and really fully take part. Question, I see that my dear chairman, my favorite chairman, is telling me that I have no time left. I want to take this opportunity to thank you once again, and I send, I send you my best wishes for the future. Thank you very much, and good evening. Hey, well, thank you, Alexi. And uh, now we're moving over to uh, Ms. McPherson from the NDP for, uh, for five minutes. And Ms. McPherson, you'll be our last uh, questioner. I get that. I get that role every single time, which is which is my my luckiness, I guess. Uh, one of the things that I was looking at, gentlemen, is on the the IPU website, the interactive map of the latest cases of MPs in danger, and it it brought to mind for me that there are regions of the world that we already know would be would be high risk for for parliamentarians to participate um, to to be safe, especially of course. And I'm just wondering what what role the IPU sees for themselves or if you if you do have a role in terms of preventative um, actions or prevented ways to prevent um, things happening to parliamentarians before it happens. Do you have any role with that or is that is that outside of your scope? Mr. Carter, maybe I'll pass it to you first. Uh, listen, I think it's really a, a a question for David McGinty to answer. He's on the executive. He's the one that develops uh, the wider scope of IPU. I think it could do more, um, but really it's an executive question. And Mr. McGinty? You know, one of the interesting things about the IPU, Mr. Chair and Ms. McPherson, is that the tagline, the slogan is for democracy, for everyone. And there's a, there's a view amongst the executive committee that that's the core business of the IPU. And so increasingly, I mentioned earlier that Canada has been supportive of um, additional programmatic support to help um, strengthen the participation of women in elected public life. Um, that's another, there's still, there, there's yet another request from the IPU to the government today for another program very similar, but the Swedish government and other governments provide programmatic support to do just that, to build capacity to build an understanding of the rule of law and good governance and institutional strengthening. There's best practices that is being shared on a regular basis. Um, there's a new um, task force uh, committee on anti-terrorism, um, given some of the you know, fundamental questions in that area that we're all facing. So there is a, a strengthening role, uh, hopefully amplified throughout the whole community, but there's more to be done. And we need as many young, dynamic, and not so young, dynamic parliamentarians to join us on this journey. So, Mr. Chair, through you, everyone is invited to join and hopefully help participate and get the message out. 
Wonderful. And I guess I would just finish my my intervention today by asking for each of you to share one of your stories of success, where one of the ones that you've really seen that the IPU has been able to make a, a big impact in the in in protecting our parliamentarians in doing work for that the IPU has undertaken. Well, for, for me, without doubt, it would be, our, it would be the Maldives. Uh, to travel there, a privilege to then watch a subsequent election. And as I said the last time, I had a look at now well-functioning democracy. So for me, that was the ideal. I think the frustration is many of the reports you produce and ta uh, table to the IPU plenary, you don't see enough change. Uh, Turkey, for example regular mm -hmm. reports on the situation in Turkey and progress is slow. Can I just conclude, because I may not get another chance, Mr. Chair, to make three quick points. First of all, from my point of view, and I think for many of you, the amount of abuse of elected representatives around the world is far higher than I ever imagined possible. Second point is this committee's work makes a difference. I am convinced of that. Sometimes it's frustratingly slow, but we get there. My final point is I had a look and there are at least two vacancies on this committee at the moment. And I think somebody from Canada would be an ideal person to go onto this committee. We currently have representatives from Uganda and from Venezuela. Listen, they don't come with the backing that you come from with your Canadian democratic system, which is well recognized right throughout the world. So in my closing address, my challenge is to you, uh, talk to Mr. Kim McGinty, find out the process now for replacing at least two of those members. And I look forward to seeing at least one of you there as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. And uh, so that, that's, uh, that's terrific. First, uh, just on behalf of, uh, of our committee and our colleagues, uh, let me say a, a big thank you to, uh, for, to David McGinty, our colleague and friend, for reaching out to us to, uh, to, to be here before us, and, and also for bringing your, uh, your uh, Kiwi down under friend and uh, Speaker Carter. It was, uh, it was great to, uh, to hear what you've had to say and your experience and your history. And thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. It's uh, been a real privilege and, uh, and we thank you both. So thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, colleagues.